Hello. Well, we've gone through a lot of machine learning up until this point in this section of the course. And what we've gone through is what we typically call actual machine learning. And what we're going to start to look at from now on is what we call deep learning. But we've gone through a lot. I want to give you just a really quick break. This isn't an essential lesson. This has got nothing to do with what's going to be in the exam. But what I'm going to demonstrate in this video is a physical representation of how deep learning could be maybe physically visualized. And so I want you to have a look at this, have a look at how we can train matchboxes to play tic-tac-toe, and keep it in the back of your mind as we progress on through the rest of deep learning. So take a little bit of a break, sit back, have a cup of tea, watch this uh, lesson before we dive into neural networks and the real side of deep learning. This example of a deep learning, if you like, machine learning demonstration actually dates back to 1960 or 1961, where Donald Mitchie, who was a colleague of the famous founder of modern day computing, Alan Turing, where Donald came up with this way of being able to train a set of matchboxes to be able to play tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. And so in this lesson, I'm going to show you just how he did that. Basically, what he did was he amassed a collection of 304 matchboxes. And on each matchbox, he put a label on the end to represent a different place in the game of tic-tac-toe. And I've got behind me a tic-tac-toe board, which has got different colors to represent the different positions on that board. And what uh, Donald did was in each of the matchbox, he had a little counter and the little counter was a different color, there was different colored counters in there, and each color counter represents a position on the tic-tac-toe board. And so he started out with 304 matchboxes, all with an equal number of different beads in each of the box. So initially box one had two of the gray or black and two of the orange and two of the magenta and two of the white and two of the green, two of all of the different positions. And it was like that throughout the entire board. Then when we wanted to ask this system um, where it wanted to play, where did you want to put a, a, an O on the board, for example, you'd take the matchbox, you'd give it a bit of a shake, you'd open it up, and you'd pick out a bead at random, you'd look at the colour, and that's where you'd go on the board. And if you keep doing that, it'll probably lose, because it's going to be completely random whether it wins or loses that game. But here's the key. At the end of that go, you line up all the matchboxes that actually took part in that go. And you look at all of the colours of the beads that meant that uh, the machine, the process, got to that point. And if it didn't win, as it almost certainly wouldn't have done, you remove those beads from the equation so that it's less likely for the, for the system to make that choice again. If, by some crazy fluke, it happened to win, well, you would take all of those color bead choices that it made, and you would give it more beads of, that, of those colors. More beads so that it's more likely to make that choice next time around, so that when you shake that box, it's more likely that you would pick out that particular color bead, and it's more likely that you'd reach a positive conclusion to the game. And maybe if you drew, then maybe you don't change the colors, or maybe you just add one. Because of course, tic-tac-toe, noughts and crosses, it's a solved game. If you're playing against an ideal opponent, then you're never going to win. You're always going to get to a checkmate. And so by doing this, and playing the game over and over and over again, each time laying out the matchboxes that, um, that meant that that position was played, each time looking at those beads and either giving it more beads of that colour or taking them away, over many, many iterations, the system will learn how to play tic-tac-toe. And you'll find that eventually it will always play you to a draw. Now, I didn't want to just tell you about this, and I didn't want to show you this in a PowerPoint presentation. I wanted to show you it in real life. And so over here, I have a board, and on it I have 304 matchboxes, which are all currently trained up using exactly that method to be able to play tic-tac-toe. And so we should have a game and actually show that it actually works. Donald called this thing menace. 
And honestly, once you've been living with 304 matchboxes filled with hundreds, I don't know, maybe even thousands of beads, it is pretty menacing. Anyway, let's have a go at playing tic-tac-toe against Menace with that training process that I just described. Now, part of the rules of this is that Menace always goes first. And so box number one up here um, has got the game position on it of a sort of blank game position. There is no game position. So Menace is going to go first. We're going to use this matchbox um, to choose the position. So um, let's get rid of these sort of empty matchboxes. Let's have a look at this one. We'll give it a bit of a shake. We'll open it up and I'll look away to give it a completely random choice. And I'll put the bead color in front of the box there. And it's a white bead. And that is the center of the board. And that's probably what we would expect a knowledgeable player to do. So I'm gonna put a zero or an, an O in the center of the board there. So Menace has played its go. Now it's up to me to make my next move. So I'm going to go uh, top left. I'm going to go up there. And so what we now have to do is look through the Menace system um, and look to try and find a matchbox which represents that position on the board. So an X in the top left and an O in the middle. Um, and I have that box here. And I'm just going to place that down here and gently put Menace down because if I mess up all the beads, I will not be happy. And so we have that position on this box here. So we give it a bit of a shake. We open it up. I reach inside and it's come out as green. So that means that we're now going to place uh, Menace's O over here. So Menace is obviously trying to go for a three across the middle. That's what it wants to do. So I'm going to have to block it because I'm trying to play to win here. So I'm going to put an X over on the side there. So now we have to go back to the Menace system and look to try and find that game position on one of the labels. Um, so this can take some time, but I will get there. Let's have a look. Uh, two O's and an X, two O's. I think it's here. And this introduces one of the interesting scenarios about this. As I said, it took 304 matchboxes, um, but there's not actually 304 unique positions on the board. There's actually a great deal more than that. Um, but in order to keep it sort of manageable, um, we've set it up like this so that the game positions can be rotated. You see that the game position being like this um, is exactly the same game if we were to rotate the board by 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And so I have here a box which represents this particular game position. Um, and it looks like it does, but if I rotate it around like that, then it almost represents this game position. I then need to flip it as well. And so this specially designed game board can do just that. And if you think about it, as we're doing this, we're not moving any of the X's, we're not moving any of the O's in the game space. We're just moving them in the sort of physical space of where they are on the board. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so to make this match this box, I need to uh, rotate this magic piece of glass that was in front of the board. You didn't know that, did you? And um, so I'm going to rotate that around like that and then flip it over like that. And now we have the uh, noughts and crosses in exactly the same position as we have on this box. And that's how we managed to rationalize the number of positions in the game down to 304. Top tip if you wanted to make this yourself. So we give this a bit of a shake. Um, we open it up. I pick a bead out at random. And um, we'll put that one back and uh, put it in front. So it's a pink bead. It's a pink bead that we've got out of there. That's where Menace wants to go next. So we're going to put an O there. Now, again, I'm playing to win. So um, obviously Menace is trying to win across the middle here. So I'm going to put my X down here. And this is interesting. So Menace has to now stop me from winning by going down in the bottom corner there. Let's see where Menace is going to go. And I need to look up for obviously that game position and find it in the boxes. And that might take me just a moment to do. All right, I think I found it. It actually takes a lot longer to find sometimes than you think. Um, so I think I found it. I found this box here, which is number 204 in my Menace machine. So um, let's take this and do the magic flip. So it's uh, flipped that way. That's it. That's it. It's flipped that way. It's, I think it might be flipped back to the orientation it was in in the first place, maybe. So let's balance that up. OK, so now we uh, take this box and I feel it actually hasn't got very many um, in here at all. So um, let's open it up, take it out and place that color in front. 
um, and it's uh, picked up a purple bead. Um, and purple means it goes here, which has absolutely stopped me from winning across the top there. And so now uh, I can go either here for an X, that's not going to let me win, here for an X. I have to go here actually to stop Menace from winning. So let's put an X into that position there. So we've got through to a draw. Um, and this is absolutely what I would expect, and that's what I was expecting, because every time you play Menace now, it gets through to that draw position. Initially, it would lose a lot, and you'd update the beads in the boxes so that it got to the point where it was doing better and better, but it was never going to get to the point where it would win because it's playing against, I guess, a perfect player. Me, I'm, I'm trying. I know how to play tic-tac-toe, and I know how to always force a draw. So the only position we can get to now is get to a draw. Now, if I was to play against Menace and I was to intentionally throw the game, then it still might not win because it's never seen that before. It's not been trained against that. It doesn't understand the notion that it could win. So out of the many, many iterations it's done, it's only ever now going to get to a draw. And so it's probably understanding the futility of it all. And maybe it understands that the only way to win is to not play at all.